What up, what up, what up? We back in this place. October 20th, 2019, 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, 8 o'clock on the West Coast. Back at you for another edition of Gen Sports Corner Live. Have, have a bunch of topics to talk to you guys about. Um, I'm going to get into the Sixers and the end of the preseason. The opener is coming up this Wednesday. It's almost here, man. The NBA season is officially starting on the 22nd. So this Tuesday, it's coming up quick. It's right here. It is upon us. I'm going to be talking about the fight on Friday night between Vita Biev and Godzik. That was a really good fight over at the Leah Chorus Center down uh, up on Broad in Philly. That was a banger. And then I'm going to get into my week seven predictions for the NFL. So a lot is going on, Jules. I got a lot to get into, so let me waste no time. As you, as you can see, I'm excited about my Raiders today playing the Packers. Big game for us. We got a lot of injuries, but we'll see how it plays out. But first and first and foremost, if there are things that you want to hear me talk about that are off script, the script is in the description. Leave it in the comments. But I'm gonna jump into the, the NBA first and foremost. So the Sixers first. A lot of things that I like that I saw in the preseason. I love what I saw out of Embiid. Hell yeah. Can't wait for them Sixers, man. I love what I saw out of MB. I like the progression that I saw out of Simmons taking the taking the jump shots in transition, taking them when he comes into the half court set, taking a three. I'll take it. That's good enough for me. One's better than zero. And seeing the the defense, the defense, defense, defense. Brett Brown came out and said that he really hoped that, and we we're striving to be the number one defense in the NBA. You got the Sixers. You have the Clippers. You have even the Lakers as potentially top-tier NBA defensive teams. But you look at this Sixers squad, nobody's shorter than 6'9", 6'10", outside of Josh Richardson, who's 6'6", which is not short. And he's your, what, starting shooting guard? And he's a defensive presence. So you have him at shooting guard, very good two-way player, an ascending player on offense. Then you have Ben Simmons, who's 6'10" who's able to – he has the length. He's, he, he has good defense. He's able to guard in the perimeter, good in the paint. You have Tobias Harris, who's now able to slide to the three spot when needed or most likely for, for the majority of the time when Al Horford's not on the floor. Then you have Al Horford playing the four, who is a defensive presence, gives you versatility, can go out to the perimeter, can play down in the paint, and he, he – He's bringing that same defensive prowess that he had when he was playing with the Celtics for the last four or five years. And then, obviously, the big guy himself, Embiid, down, down on the block, the shot blocker, the defensive presence, the guy that you, you don't want to go down there in, in the paint against all those trees with the Sixers right now. And that's, that's the great thing. Now you can leave Embiid under the rim, and you can send Al Horford out to cover a stretch four. And you can really put pressure on teams to try to fig- have to figure out another way to attack this defense. So I really like the potential for this defense this year. Right, right next to them is obviously the Clippers, because you know obviously you have Paul George, All Pro, all, all you know, first team NBA defensive player. I don't know if he was this year, but he typically is. He has that type of skill set. And then obviously the Claw Kawhi. Then you have Travis Beverly really lock a lot of teams down on that perimeter so you want to shoot threes on those guys good luck you're gonna have to find another way to beat them and then you have Anthony Davis and LeBron out there across town in in LA LA is lit right now in terms of talent and potential for teams to go to the NBA finals in the west it's going to be exciting basketball this year the west is really stacked with the Lakers the Clippers Golden State, they're still around. As long as you have Steph Curry and you have Draymond and you have Clay, he's going to come back probably in February or March. Then you have Utah. They they slowly, quietly, quietly been getting better. They they put they brought in little pieces here and there. They'd be really quiet and under the radar. That's a team to watch out for. I'm telling you. Have obviously Portland. You, you still got Dame Lillard. You know, Dame Dollar sign, and you got McCollum, and they brought in somebody at center to replace Ennis Cantor. I really like what they did this offseason, and they're 
the, the West is stacked. And the East, in my opinion, is really the Sixers and the Bucks. The Celtics, they've always been there. They're still a solid team with Kemba Walker filling in the void left by Kyrie Irving leaving to go to the Nets. But not only did they lose Al Horford, who was an integral part of their offense from a stretch four perspective and a stretch five perspective and on defense, but they lost him to their division rival with the Sixers, not only getting weaker, but making the Sixers stronger in the process. No pun intended. So outside of the Bucks, I don't really see any other teams really competing to come out of the East. Now, knock on wood, hopefully injuries don't happen to the Sixers and, and these other teams, but they're not as common in basketball, but over the last couple of years, we've been having some freak injuries, so you never know. That's my thoughts on the Sixers. I'm excited. I know you guys are excited. This Wednesday, I think they're going to the Boston Garden, and they're going to be playing the Celtics, our hated, hated rivals, opening game of the year. How can you not get hyped for that? I'm ready. So let's go. So that that's my thoughts on the NBA. And really quickly, World Series, the Astros are now going to be facing the Washington Nationals in the World Series. The, Na the Astros won on a walk-off home run against Avaldis Chapman against the, uh, with the Yankees last night. So, And according to the betting odds, the Astros are the heaviest favorites to win the World Series since 2007. And hopefully that plays out because I don't want to see the Nationals win the World Series after Bryce just came over there to the Phillies. That already had to hear enough trash from those guys, and deservedly so, for, for Bryce leaving and him being the reason or one of the reasons that they were being held back from going to a World Series. And this is their first World Series since they were the Expos? Or maybe, no, this might be the first World Series appearance, period, between the Nationals and the Montreal Expos. So, you know, kudos to them, but I still don't want them to win. <laughs> and hopefully they, hey, they made it. Good for them. I hope they lose, and then we can turn the corner next year. But I really don't have a lot of faith in this Phillies front office. That press conference was fucking bizarre. And hopefully they make the moves they need to, to make so that we don't ever have to see one of our co-owners speak during a press conference again and really show, in my opinion, the ineptitude of the vision that they have for where they want to take this team. Because if that's what Matt Quintek and, and Andy McPhail have to deal with behind closed doors, good luck. I feel bad for them dudes. That's my thoughts on baseball real quick. Let me get into boxing. Slide on to that. There was a big fight on Friday at the Leo Cora Center up on North Broadway Temple for the 175-pound belt. It was a unific unification belt, I think, between the WBA and WBC belts. I might be wrong on that, but it was a unification belt between Arthur BWF and I can't remember his first name, but Godsick. He's a really good fighter. They're both from they're both Eastern Bloc fighters. Eastern Bloc being from from Russia. They're both Eastern Bloc fighters. I don't know if that would be the Eastern Bloc country. There's a lot of different countries in the Eastern Bloc, but they're from that that new class of fighters from that area that haven't been making noise. You know, these guys, including like Lomachenko, Vasily Lomachenko, if you haven't heard of him, or Alexander got uh, Usyk, who just made his heavyweight debut. Triple G, another Eastern Bloc fighter from Kazakhstan. So a lot of, a lot of fighters from that area that have been making noise. And this was, I didn't see the fight, but I heard it was a really good one. It was really close through the first eight rounds. Uh, some of the two of the judges had Godzik up in the fight by one to two rounds. One judge had BWF up in the fight. And in the ninth and tenth rounds, BWF out was it forty nine to eight in terms of power punches, and he started hurting them, and he stopped Godzik in the tenth round. And kudos to him, man. That's why you call him the beast because he just wears people down. He comes in there with with one goal, and that's to 
make you quit or stop you or knock you out. One of the others, one of the other. I mean, that's to to, to stop you or or to, or not or knock you out. One of those two options. And he he was able to stop Godsick. Godsick was tagging him up, piecing him up, from what I heard. And he just eventually wore Godsick down over time, though. Even though he was getting pieced up, so I got to look at the replay of that. There's some other fights that are coming up. There's a big fight in December between Andy Ruiz and Anthony Joshua, the rematch. Ruiz has been losing a lot of weight. There was talk about him going to the Olympics, but I guess maybe that might not be happening, and he got pressured by the WBC into actually not going there and taking this rematch with Anthony Joshua. He lost a lot of weight for this fight. Maybe that works for him. Maybe it doesn't. We'll find out. We don't know what's going on with Deontay Wilder. Tyson Fury's doing WWE stuff, so who the hell knows what's going to happen there if the rematch is ever going to happen. You know, he probably has a better chance of fighting The Undertaker than he has of <laughs> fighting Deontay Wilder at this point, from what I know. But that's neither here nor there. Triple G, he had a, a really tough fight against uh, Darianchenko last week. I said my video last week, so we'll see what's next for him. Canelo Alvarez is fighting on the second against Sergey Kovalev at 175. That's going to be a very good fight. I'm going to be making a prediction bid for that fight. Some not this week, but the following week, uh, I'll be making a prediction bid for that one. That's going to be a big one on the zone. Get the app if you don't have it already. I think I believe it's 10.99 a month. Well worth the money. A lot of big fights down the stretch, as well as UFC and Bellator fights. Not UFC, but Bellator fights. With that being said, let me go ahead and slide into these Week 7 predictions. I'll get into the Raiders and the Eagles last because those are my teams. But I'll start off with the other ones and give you my, my breakdowns of each game and my predictions. So let's jump right into it. First game on the slate, 1 o'clock game, the New York Giants playing at home against the Arizona Cardinals. Now, these spreads are are spreads that were out there on Monday. So, yes, the, the lines have changed, but not too significantly for the most part from my knowledge. So, Giants favored by three against Arizona as of Monday. So... This is going to be a high – this is slated to be a high-scoring game. I believe the over-under is 50-and-a-half points, so they're, they're, they're thinking that a lot of points are going to be scored here. So you have Evan Ingram back healthy. You have Saquon is back. He didn't have an in, injury designation this week, so full practice participant, that's huge for the Giants. And Danny Dimes-Jones up there in New York. You have Sterling Shepard out, but you have Golden Tate, who's back from, from suspension. So you have Golden Tate starting with you have a healthy Saquon back. That's pretty big. Yo, welcome, Zave. Uh, I talked about the B2BF Gazik fight about five minutes ago. I'm going to get into football, so stay around for my predictions on the Eagles and Cowboys. But once this video is over, go go back and I'll leave the timestamp. You can look at my, my breakdown of the Gazik and B2BF fight. Um, back to the Giants in, in Arizona. Um, Arizona, David Johnson on offense, he might be out. Christian Kirk, starting right wide receiver, he might be out. So those are two big injuries on offense for them. You have Adrian, uh, Patrick Peterson back, which is huge. For I think they're the 31st or 32nd ranked pass defense in, in the NFL right now. And their their secondary is definitely giving up almost the most amount of yards in the NFL this year through the air. But having Patrick Peterson is going to definitely change that for sure significantly. So you're going to have Peterson probably on Golden Tate for most of this game. So we'll see how that affects the flow, how these offensives go up and down the field. The Giants' defense isn't particularly good. So Kyler Murray, with his legs, with his arm, he's going to be able to do some things in the passing game and in the run game with his legs. We'll see if David Johnson's healthy. That A lot is going to hinge on that, in my opinion, for the Cardinals. But I have the Giants winning this game, and I have them covering the spread as well. Next game on the slate, 
Houston Texans playing in Indianapolis. Colts favored by one point. That means that the betters and Vegas feel as though this is a coin flip. This is almost a 50-50 game between these two teams. Indianapolis, I said it before, after Andrew Luck retired, they're not as bad as people think they're going to be. I, Jacoby Brissett, he showed us some things two years ago when Andrew Luck was injured, and he's showing us some things now. So you have him, you have a healthy T.Y. Hilton, who always has a big game against the Texans, and he's going up, matchup alert, he's going up against Jonathan Joseph, 36 years old, doesn't have the same wheels he had before. I, I think that's a mismatch right there. If you got him on your, on your fantasy teams, start upside. This is going to be a high-scoring game. I think the over-under is about 53, 54 points, so they think it's going to be a shootout. You, you have Deshaun Watson in, in consideration for the MVP uh, voting this year. You have, you have Nuck. You have DeAndre Hopkins, who has not had the type of year you would have expected, but he still has that potential to, to break out at any time. Then you have Will Fuller, the deep threat. I, I think this is going to be a high-scoring game. Houston's defense through the air, they're, they're not that good. They're, 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 not, they're really not that good. And then they showed us some things over this past week. You know, you saw them shut down the Kansas City Chiefs by just manning their asses up and forcing them to to make tough throws and allowing the front the the, the uh, front four to get there. They really smothered their receivers and took away Patty Mahomes' first read. And I, I believe that they're going to try to do the same thing, not only to Deshaun Watson, but a lot of these teams on their schedule moving forward this year. So don't be surprised if the Colts get a little bit of a lead and play keep away. I wouldn't be surprised to see that. So I this is a tough game to pick, but I'm picking the Colts to win this game. I'm picking them to cover the spread as well, but that's a tough one. But I am picking, picking the Colts to win this game. Next game on the slate, the Buffalo Bills playing in Buffalo against the Miami Hurricanes. I mean the Miami Dolphins, who have not won a game yet. <clears throat> the Bills are favored by 17 points. The over-under is only 40 and a half points. So if they're favored by 17, let's see, eight points. Tw- they, they, <laughs> they're they slated to beat them 28 to 12. So basically, Vegas believes that the, the Bills are going to beat the fuck out of the Dolphins this week. I don't know if they cut. And I think the spread is 16 and a half as of today. What's going on, Chris? Welcome, man. I don't know if they beat them by 17 points. That might be a stretch. But it could happen because they're that bad. I'm going out on a limb and I'm picking the Bills to cover the spread. That's a risky pick for me, but I'm just going to go. But when this game, there's not really much to talk about there. Unless you want to talk about what fantasy players that you have that may be Buffalo Bills. Or maybe Kenyon Drake on the Dolphins. That's that's really about it. So I'm picking the Bills to win this game. Uh, Yo, Chris, I'm I'm not that far from your 49ers as well, so stay tuned. They're playing the the foreskins this week, so it's gonna help me out one way or another. Not not that the Redskins are, are really in this divisional race anyway, but next game on the slate, Detroit Lions playing at home against the Minnesota Vikings. Vikings favored by one point on the road in Detroit. This is a tough game. This is a division game. Division games are always difficult. The Vikings are coming off a blowout win against the Eagles last week. They really exposed a lot of deficiencies in our secondary. Stephon Diggs went off. Adam Thielen, he didn't go off-off, but he still had his way. He did what he wanted to. Dalvin Cook, he didn't have a good game against the top-ranked rush defense in the NFL in the Eagles, but I believe he'll bounce back against this Detroit Lions. Horrible, but they're not like the 85 Bears either. And uh, this is a tough one because Detroit is sneaky good. This The NFC North might be the best division in football, arguably next to the NFC West right now. Those two divisions are the best in football, and I might have to argue. That's 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 a up for debate. But this is a tough division. The Lions are really sneaky good. That I think the over-under for this game is like 41 or 42 points. 
Vegas doesn't see this being a high scoring game. I don't necessarily either. I actually believe that Detroit might win this game. I have them upsetting Minnesota by covering this spread. And I believe that they might be able to pull out this game against the Vikings because I I think that the Vikings are you know what? I take that back. I'm actually going to pick the Minnesota Vikings. The, the, the Lions are going to cover the spread of one point. I'm, I'm going to go with Detroit for the upset. I'm going to go to Detroit for the upset. Because even though Darius Slay has is questionable with the hamstring, I believe he's going to be starting. And that's that's big. When you're going to have Diggs going up against Darius Slay, and you're going to have to have the, the offense funneled through Thielen and Dalvin Cook, can they win? Yes, but we're going to see whether Kirk Cousins is who we think he is because he showed inconsistency outside of the Eagles game against every other team he's faced. And this, when it comes to division games, you know each other. You know your strengths. You know your weaknesses. I'm going to go out on a limb, pick the Lions for the upset. Next game on the docket, Jacksonville Jaguars, the Rams, Cincinnati, favored by three points on the road. I'm picking Jacksonville for this game because Cincinnati is just putrid, putrid, horrible. The, it's going to be a close game, though. They're horrible, but it's going to be a close game if that makes sense. Just because that Jacksonville run defense is not good, and Joe Mixon, that should be a good max, ma- matchup for him, and Giovanni Bernard on – on the Bengals, but their O-line is so bad, I don't know if they're going to be able to take advantage of that weakness with the Jacksonville defense through the have Tyler Boyd, but they can't protect Andy Dalton. That's that's the issue for me right here with the if they get off the schneid, they might go 0-6 so, or 0-7 if they haven't had the bye week yet. 